Hey, Joey, did I not tell you just to do it? Now I'm telling you, you gotta do it. Hey, hey. Hey, I'm your older brother, Joey. I'm telling you something. I know what you said. I ain't doing it. I don't care if you get mad. I ain't doing it. Fucking nut. <laughs> Welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where we are continuing our season of Scorsese with an exploration of arguably his most iconic film. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host and uh, voiceover guy in, the San, in San Diego, California, um, and a big boxing film fan. So I was very much Looking forward to walking back into this movie, Stephen. Steve, Stephen, uh, as our season of Scorsese, <laughs> as our season of Scorsese continues, because this is a film that I don't run back to and watch often. Because it ain't Rocky, it ain't Digstown, it, it ain't any of these fun boxing movies that excite me. Um, and we just did Rocky Three, uh, Rocky Three watch along for our patrons. Oh, for everybody, actually. We put that out for free for everybody. So this was one that I was uh, a little nervous about walking back into. It is not It is not easy, No, <laughs> this film. Raging Bull is not an easy film. It takes a lot out of me. Um, and I, I agree with you, by the way. I know, I think I've said this before uh, on the cinephiles, that I think the two most cinematic sports are baseball and boxing. Yeah. And the, and the reason is, is because it's they, they're very clear. Like, yes. You watch a complicated soccer player, complicated basketball player, complicated football. But there's a lot of things going on. Yeah. Whereas baseball and boxing, they really come down to two people, individual things going on. Yeah. Where and and moments they're like, it's three, it's you know full count in the bottom of the ninth, and we need a home run, or you're down on points and you need a knockout. It's yeah. very clear and very dramatic. And but I will say, Raging Bull is unlike any other boxing in the way it's filmed, in its yes. tone, everything about it. Yeah, I agree 100%. But before we dig into Raging Bull, we have a very important announcement, which we announced already on our live show, but we want to announce it again here, which is now officially, for the first time ever, we have a subscription tier available on Apple Podcasts. We know yeah. that Apple Podcasts is where actually the majority of people listen to our show. We've always had Patreon where we offer ad-free versions of the show and our cinephile shorts, and now we're bringing all of that to Apple Podcasts. This episode and the last couple of months are all available ad-free. Our last couple of months of shorts are all available on Apple Podcasts for a subscription price of $4.99 for a month or $49.99 for the whole year. And we're also in the process, and it is a process, it'll take a little while, of getting our entire catalog available on Apple Podcasts ad-free, as well as over 200 cinephile shorts, all from Patreon. They are all coming to Apple Podcasts. Yeah, I mean, it was a great uh, thing to finally put in motion, Steve. Hopefully, some of you who maybe have some trepidation with the Patreon or with other uh, places that you've looked at and we've wanted uh, support from, you look at the Apple uh, uh, subscriber there and you, and you uh, the situation there and you say to yourself, hey, this is something that I can do. This is something I know is really easy for me. And you'll come aboard and be a part of that. So, And we're offering, obviously, these great benefits uh, for being a part of that as well. And, of course, our Patreon, patreon.com slash the cinephiles, multiple tiers. We're delivering on all the stuff that we have planned on delivering for quite some time. We're very proud of all the people who've come aboard recently and who've been aboard for a while now. And uh, we're getting a lot of positive feedback all from a lot of them, from a lot of the patrons about all the stuff that we're giving them. So very much doing extra work, doing more stuff for all of you all to show you how much we appreciate you supporting us. So come and join us there uh, in the multiple places that you can to support us here on the cinephiles as we keep going and we keep building, which is always a great thing to see in our, in our show. That's right. So uh, check out Apple Podcasts right now. And with one click, if you are already an Apple person, with one click, you're a subscriber of the Cinephiles. We'll appreciate your support. And we're going to try to deliver a whole bunch of extra content to you there. So Raging Bull, John, how did you first come to this film? You know, I've spoken about this for a while now, Steve, those, those, um, when I went through that period back in the early 90s, or no, sorry, in the late 90s into the 2000s, Study where I was uh, at working at in Charlottesville, Virginia, at a television station, and I had a friend, my friend Wade, 
who had just graduated from uh, the Chicago Film School or Film School in Chicago. And he was the one that I, I had seen, you know, all these other Scorsese films, but he was the one that was like, you've got to watch Raging Bull. And I believe I watched it at the Charlottesville University of Virginia Public Library there in Charlottesville on Laserdisc. I think I watched it on Laserdisc, if it existed on Laserdisc back then, and was able to see the film. And I have to say, that film absolutely knocked me on my ass, made me super uncomfortable. And um, is a film that went, that uh, I don't go back to often because it takes so much out of me. But this time around watching it, Steve, I found that I was the right age to understand and appreciate a lot of what Scorsese was trying to say through Jake LaMotta in the movie. And at an hour and 40 minutes, I had to stop myself from finishing the film because I had other things I wanted to do. But I almost postponed everything to keep watching the movie. So it was a blast to discover it the first time around in terms of what it asked of me as a, a, a burgeoning cinephile, but even more so now what it asked me as an experienced cinephile to enjoy about the film. So I watched it uh, at the era we've talked about of like becoming a cinephile in the yeah. late eighties. And I was starting to go through the great directors and yeah. it was when I watched taxi driver and it was when I watched King of comedy and some of these other Scorsese films. And I I'm not going to say I didn't get it, but I am going to say like, I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> that that's makes fair. sense. I think that's it's totally like, makes sense. I watched it. And then I just was like, I don't, I, I, I think I was stunned. Like I didn't go like, Oh, I like that. Or I didn't like that. I thought it was amazing. And then just was like, I, I think it took a lot more maturity for me to like, kind of be willing to go to the places this movie wants you to go. Yeah. And then, in the late nineties, I ended up working on the DVD. And so that's oh. when I heard some of the commentary tracks and right. I learned some of the behind the scenes. And that's where my fascination with the movie grew. And I've watched it more since, and you know, I, we've said this over and over again on the cinephiles and it's become a cliche that things hit you at different times of your life yeah. in different ways. And watching it this time, I had a par partially because I'm going to, it, you know, through it with a fine tooth comb, but it's just like really studying it and going, I think it's one of the most remarkable, one of the most uh, almost surgical in the way that it's done in its attention to detail. It's funny. I said something to you completely foolish uh, when we were in the middle of Goodfellas going like, yeah. oh, Raging Bull is going to be easier because it's a simpler film. It doesn't <laughs> have the fast yeah. movement and all the chaos. There's just yeah. so much going on all the time in Goodfellas. And going through this, this time I was like, no, there's just as much. Its pace is very different. Yeah. And the way it does it. But there's so many details where you're like, why is there a shot of his hands there? Why are we looking through it at this way? What does that look mean? What does that reaction shot mean? What is this person thinking at this moment? And it's like, there's so much here. It is just one of the most. I understand Citizen Kane better than I understand Raging Bull, if that wow. makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. the, there's a clarity of Citizen Kane. Yeah even in its ambiguity, right. which isn't in Raging Bull, where you're just like, what is this? You know? Yeah. Well, I don't want to jump the gun here because I know Steve is great at laying groundwork for pre-production and all of that for our films, and I appreciate that he does that. But I'm going to bring this up here because it seems to make sense for what you just said. I mean, this is a film that Scorsese is making at a time when he is uh, close to killing himself. He is suffering through a cocaine addiction. Robert De Niro is the one who brings him this book and repitches him this film. And I think we get the most intimate film that Scorsese has ever directed. And by that, I mean nothing like intimate, like, oh, sexual or like really. I mean, we are inside this world so viscerally at every moment that the world is happening, that it is uncomfortable for us to be this close. And I think about the scene where Kathy Moriarty is kissing Robert De Niro's ribs and his diaphragm and his stomach. And it's like, we shouldn't be this close. We should not be this close. And we're seeing the boxing scenes inside the ring. And Scorsese wanted to make sure the cameras were inside the ring based off a film from the 1940s. He wanted that intimate feeling. And so, we're even intimate in the boxing sequences, Steve. So I think the film is a physically intimate film. 
and I don't know what cocaine is like, and I've never done cocaine, but I imagine coming out of an addiction, you are more aware viscerally of every sensation and feeling and touch and everything. So your mind is in a completely different place as you try to climb out of it to find some kind of normal uh, um, a normalcy again that you had before you slid into the addiction. So I just wonder as an artist at the time, combining all these things together, we get this kind of a movie that has a style to it, but an intimacy to it that we've never seen in any of the other Scorsese films. And I think in any of the other boxing films that have ever been made. And I think that's another reason why this film is so supremely unique, not only as a boxing film, but as a, as a Scorsese film overall. It, it, it's so funny. I agree with everything you said, by the way. Okay. It's, I want to make sure. Am I talking shit? Okay. I want to make no, sure. No, 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 I, I no. I think you're right on, on the money with that. And it's so funny thinking about this in comparison to Rocky. Because A, there's not there really isn't a raging bull without Rocky. It probably no, would never right. have happened. And B, they're both kind of independent sort of films. Yeah. They're both about these characters that are not traditionally Hollywood. Right. They both are deep character studies. I mean, the the there, there's actually more focus on boxing in Raging Bull than there really is in Rocky in oh, some sure. ways, you know. And and yet they're so completely different in yeah. terms of tone, you know, that they're just, they're just, well, and the thing is, is I love Rocky more than Raging Bull because sure. I love Rocky. It's just deep core love. It's an underdog but, story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it moves me and I cry and I get yeah. everything I want to get out of Rocky. I, in terms of just sheer filmmaking and direction, there's yeah. no comparison with Raging Bull, you know, a hundred percent. Right. You know, it's at a whole other level. So, hey, so just to start, I think we should start with Jake LaMotta. And, you know, frequently when we do uh, things that are based on a pre true story, I will have read the book that it's based on. Mm. A, this book wasn't available on Audible, so I did not read it. And B, I'm kind of glad that I didn't. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. And maybe you'll know more about sort of the fact versus fiction. I don't have a lot of that. But what I do know mm. is that Jake LaMotta got beat up at eight years old, went to his dad. His dad basically said, never let that happen again. Sounds like his dad was a scary guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he ended up, you know, he did a lot of stuff on the streets, ended up in reform school at 16. That's where he officially started boxing and he won all his fights. His mm -hmm. brother did some boxing as well at the time. And basically he said, I fought like I didn't care what would happen to me, which is exactly what we see in the film. Yeah. Maybe the kind of best boxer ever is the one who doesn't care what happens. Yeah. Well, there's other things you have to be able to actually have some skills too, but yes. Well, 100%. I agree. Yes, for sure. <laughs> well, you know what it is? It's funny because this, I think we're going to return to this over and over again. Um, yeah. Is Marty said something about, I didn't understand what the ring meant mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. And that's part of why, as we hear in the pre production, that he resisted doing this film. Well, I think. Man, making a what he discovered was life is the ring and making a film is the ring. And like the idea of and, you know, we were just talking off mic about struggles with our work and struggles mm -hmm. with, you know, you know, things that we know that we should be doing. It's all the ring, you know, yeah. it's all how you fight it out in the ring. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, there the film is focused so powerfully on uh, LaMada's um, self-destructive impulses and his inability to resist his anger and resist his jealousy and resist his paranoia is very similar to what Scorsese might have been going through as he was climbing out of this addiction himself because the addiction to for himself is a self-destructive impulse and addiction it's the thing that he knows he shouldn't do because it might drive people away or destroy what he's created it is there consuming him so his battle his ring is with his fight rather is with Sure. cocaine here and his ring is his life as you said and so with lamont it's the same thing as he discovers later on in life that um the battles he has in his life the ring is where he does most of his battles but it's the battles outside of the ring where he loses the most you know uh, agreed and and by the way one of the i don't know what was happening in terms of uh scorsese's cocaine addiction but i certainly know that one of the symptoms of severe cocaine addiction is paranoia yeah like yeah. that's a thing that happens to you um, and psychotic paranoia at a certain point. Um, 
So he writes the book, Jake Lamotta writes the book with Peter Savage, who appears in the movie. Yeah. Um, and they were already wanting there to be a movie. And so they are trying to approach Al Pacino and Ryan O'Neill. <laughs> and that's not going anywhere. And Robert De Niro reads the book while he was prepping for Godfather 2. So that's how early this all started. Wow. And he immediately gives the book to Martin Scorsese, who was making Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore at the time. And he wasn't interested. He did, doesn't like sports, definitely doesn't like boxing, doesn't see any way to connect with the material. And he's just like, this isn't for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's six years for yeah. of, of De Niro trying to convince Scorsese to do this film. Yeah. How interesting. It's, it's, it's rare when the actor has the instinct to go for the story over the director, you know? And so this is such an unusual story in this way. I think the drive of De Niro, this is it's this is a Martin Scorsese movie, obviously. He directed 100%. it. He's he's the director. Right. But De Niro makes this happen. And oh yeah. He at every step, doggedly, not unlike Jake LaMotta, yeah. you know, is not quitting. He is not gonna back down. He wants to make this movie happen and he yeah. keeps fighting to make it happen. Well, I mean, he must have seen something in here for himself as an actor, like this could be the thing that catapults me. This could be the thing that gets me to the mainstream that I want to be. I goes, don't get it twisted, everybody. You, you actors certainly, and even the most, um, uh, how can I say this? The most independent of actors, the most you know, kind of unique and seemingly doesn't want any kind of fame. Actor wants to be recognized at some core level for their talent, their abilities, sure, and they believe they're good at what they do, which is why they keep doing it. You know, and so. You've had at this point, what, the Taxi Driver, you've had Godfather Part Two. you've had the Deer Hunter, now it's the time to level up. Like, now it's the time to be the main lead and grab something and really go next level, right? Taxi Driver is kind of one of those independent, unsettling type of films. Godfather Part Two is an ensemble film, and then you have the Deer Hunter, which is another ensemble film. This is straight up Robert De Niro, front and center, the raging bull in this movie. Yeah. And this is maybe something that he's driven to do here and wants his buddy, his partner, his friend to be his sounding board and to guide him through this process and also help his friend climb out of this situation that he's in uh, so he can deliver another great movie. So it's an interesting film that has a lot of sadness and um, uh, uh, frustrating uh heartbreak within the film because of how tragic this guy's story is uh and it's really brutal as well um yeah. but it's a pose but it the kind of ironically saves both these guys and elevates them into the next level as we go into the 1980s i think too you know it's funny people when they talk about vision like a director has a vision or whatever mm. they, the way people tend to think about it is like oh i have this this movie in my head and i'm going to make yeah. it happen yeah. And, and a lot of times what a vision is, is I see there's something there, but I don't know what it is. Right. You know, I think De Niro reads this book and he goes, there's something here. Yeah. Would be good for me. There's something I can dig into it. Yeah. But then they had to spend years finding exactly what that thing is. Yeah. It's, it's not that he knew right from the beginning. The, the first screenwriter is uh, Mardik Martin, who's actually an NYU buddy of Martin Scorsese. Yeah. And he spent six months, it sounds like, you know, joined at the hip with Robert De Niro yeah. researching this book. They watched every boxing movie together. They flew to Miami. He spent a week with Vicky. They met Jake. They met Peter Savage, who wrote the book, worked on the script, ended up working on the script for two years. Mm -hmm. And in the end, United Artists, who was kind of attached, but not officially green lighting it. They didn't like the script. De Niro didn't like the script. And then, and, and, and throughout this whole process, He's showing drafts to Martin Scorsese, who says, yeah. look, Bob, I'm not interested. You know, like, I'm happy to, to yeah. read the latest version of the script. I'm not making this movie. And they finally go, let's bring in Paul Schrader, who obviously had done yeah. Taxi Driver and did a bunch of other, you know, so great writer. It sounds like, so Schrader talked about doing, re getting someone to help him with research. Yeah. And it sounds like he basically hired a private eye <laughs> to investigate Jake LaMotta's life. Um, and he found out all a whole bunch of other information. And the biggest thing is the character of Joey. Yeah. Jake LaMotta, when he wrote the book, didn't mention his brother at all. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. And so this, when Paul Schrader finds that out, he goes, Whoa, there's something here. Yeah. And, and of course the big thing they're trying to avoid, and this is with Marduk Martin and De Niro, this is with Paul Schrader is like, there are a lot of boxing movies. 
And there are even a lot of boxing movies where the boxer has a brother. And there are even a lot of boxing movies where they might have to take the dive and that there's the mob. And those are common things. And they didn't want to make any of those movies. Yeah. But the idea of the brother is what made it click for Paul Schrader. He, he also is a younger brother. Um, and he, and again, this is what people don't understand. You see a movie and you go, oh, well, that's how it has to work. Yeah. Well, we don't know. Like, when do you start? I mean, Schrader wrote some drafts where it started with two of them as kids, went through reform school, like all sorts of different drafts, lots of different structures. Right. And finally, he came up with what is largely the structure of the movie for Schrader, which the fights are, what are the main events, with one big exception that we'll get to. Mm -hmm. And basically, they're still not happy. And he and De Niro, you know, this is the 70s. Times are volatile. There's yeah. a lot of yelling. At one point, Paul Schrader threw the script in De Niro's face. Oh, you know that. And they finally got to a certain point. And the way Schrader says is he says he knew that he couldn't take the movie to the place where De Niro needed it to go. And that the last piece of the journey had to be Marty and Bob. And he said to De Niro, this is what this is what Paul Schrader says that he said to De Niro. Yeah, yeah. He said, Jake did it his way. I did it my way. Now you do it your way. <laughs> <laughs> Which if he said it, I love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's fantastic. <laughs> and, and then, as you mentioned, things are not going well for Martin Scorsese at this mm -hmm. point. He wasn't happy with his work. He said, I was really surprised to hear this quote from me. He's like, he felt that he had lost the passion that he had when he made Taxi Driver, that he wasn't the same filmmaker anymore. You know, and this is New York, New York, and this is, he's yeah. made The Last Waltz. And then, as you said, he's hospitalized and everyone talks around his hospitalization. Yeah. But it was, I mean, he almost died from overdose of cocaine. Yeah. He was in serious, serious health. We talked about this when we did the, talked about his whole life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he basically says De Niro saved his life. Yep. Uh, by making him quit cocaine and dragging him to Raging Bull. He comes to the hospital. I know I said this before, but I, and he either said, do you want to live or die? If you want to live, let's go make this movie. Right. Another story I heard, he says, he says, the only reason you should make a movie is if that, the feeling, if you don't make this movie, you have no reason to live. Huh. And Scorsese is still struggling with this idea of, what is the ring and what does that mean? And he finally decides in the hospital, yeah. this is what the ring is for him, you know, right. is to go out and make this movie. Yeah. Um, it's interesting with De Niro because like, you know, he was around um, Belushi, like right yeah. around the time Belushi died. Belushi, I think he was trying to get Belushi off this stuff as well. So, yeah. I, I'd so, I, my impression of who De Niro is, because he's a fairly mysterious character in some he ways. really is, yeah. You know, has changed over the years and more and more, just hearing just the, like Jake LaMotta, the passionate intensity to continue to go forward yeah. to make this movie, even when the odds are way against them, is really impressive. Yeah, he's a guy that most people don't speak intimately about. Yeah. Like their conversations but there's general conversations of, about him for sure from a lot of people and he doesn't really give these incisive interviews about his life so it's an interesting he's an interesting cat and yeah. i'm sure it's for i'm sure he knows where a lot of bodies are buried sure figuratively and he just kind of goes on with his world you know so they have a draft from paul schrader it's not where they want it to be and he, and de niro and scorsese go off to saint martin in the caribbean for a week and it sounds like this is where they they find the film um and the producers on the movie are the producers of rocky or yeah. winkler and bob chartoff um and it sounds like ua really wanted more rocky movies mm. and the reality is they wanted to make more rocky movies right but when they met with UA, they said, you know, we're not really interested in doing any more Rocky movies. Like, we, eh, we, we don't think there's really anything there. We don't really think there's a series here. You know, we want to make this Raging Bull movie. And, and UA is kind of like, if we made the Raging Bull movie, do you think that maybe you could make some more Rocky movies? And they finally reluctantly agreed. <laughs> and and we have Rocky 3 as a result, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. So now they get, they deliver the script to UA and UA hasn't officially signed anything yet. And basically they read this script and they go, holy shit, what have we gotten ourselves into? You know, <laughs> and they go to have a meeting with Scorsese and De Niro yeah. to basically tell them no. And one of the executives said something like, look, it's really the main character 
we just can't behind, get behind. And one of the executives said something like, you know, he's kind of a cockroach. Hmm. There is a pause and De Niro with incredible intensity, apparently said, he's not a cockroach. <laughs> and there was a silence in the room. Yeah. And that sincerity, that intensity, that honesty in that moment from De Niro made them green light the movie. Wow. <laughs> like just that he's not a cockroach. I imagine when you've been transfixed with a Robert De Niro gaze, um, you can't look away and you'll do what he says. I mean, well, I mean, there's so many gazes in this movie where it's like, yeah. holy shit, I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> but it's fairly terrifying. Yeah. Uh, one last thing before we jump into the movie. The decision to shoot it in black and white. I, I mean, I can't imagine it any other way, but initially they're going to make it in color. Most movies yeah. are made in color. They did some color tests with De Niro sparring, you know, and practicing. And they're with uh, Michael Powell, the British director, mm -hmm. who I had no idea was married to Thelma Schoonmaker. Oh, wow. Okay. I had no idea. Okay. And they're looking at it and they're looking at the gloves and it's the red boxing gloves, which isn't the color they would have been in the forties, but mm -hmm. they're just like, look at those red gloves. And that's when Michael Powell suggested, like, I don't think you can make this movie in color. And they said, okay, we're gonna do it black and white, which obviously the studio's against. Nobody wants movies to be in black and white. Yeah. This is one of the most gorgeous black and white films ever made. 100%. And the 4k uh, transfer, which is uh, on criterion, which you guys can pick up is gorgeous absolutely gorgeous man so before we get into the movie i want to bring up one thing <laughs> briefest of digressions we've been talking for 30 minutes okay let's go um the, the, i just read a, i just read a book you know i love books on psychology and the brain totally. and things like that and this is a book called how emotions are made and it's by lisa feldman barrett very interesting book the reason i bring it up is she brought up this thing which she says different cultures Different countries have different words for emotions. And there are all sorts of countries and all sorts of cultures that have names of emotions that we don't describe. Uh -huh. And what she says is that if you don't have a name for an emotion, we kind of don't feel it. Like that there, and it's, it's too much of a theory to go into here, but she's like, we think of all of our emotions as like there's anger, there's sadness, there's happiness, there's this, there's that, there's anxiety, yeah. whatever. And that she's like, there are other emotions we don't really have words for. Watching this movie, I felt like there are emotions going on here that I do not have words for. I don't, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like I'm, I know there's things that Jake, particularly Jake is feeling. Yeah. And I'm like, and I know, yeah. Okay. Jealousy. Yeah. Anger. Yeah. You know, those things they're, they're there, but yeah. it's like bigger. I, and, and this was my big sort of revelation of the movie is like, this is actual humanity. This isn't, here's the actor's motivation. Here's their obstacle. It's not that. This is the real, vague, gray, messy human emotion. You know? Yeah. 100%. Shall we get into the film? Let's do it. Let's dive in. Every time I see the title sequence, every time I hear that Mosc Moscani uh, intermezzo classical music playing i'm stunned by how it looks yeah this is right off the bat he is telling you what kind of film this is if you came for rocky you're in the wrong theater yeah if you came for this underdog story you're in the wrong theater you're about to watch art right and this is kind of like how godfather started right that that score playing before we get the monologue from the guy out of the darkness coming in you know uh I love America. And th that's right there announcing to you, this is not your typical gangster film. There's no Kirk Douglas in this. There's no shoot him up uh, Humphrey Bogart, Cagney stuff. This is something else, right? And I love the beginning of this. Slow motion, jumping up and down, and kind of showing you the artistry of boxing. It's a dance, choreography. It's almost ballet in a way. And using the classical music here, to show you that and to subconsciously have you feel like this is going to be an art piece uh, approach to boxing, I thought was genius. And the way he frames the camera just outside the ropes. So you feel like you're close enough to see him, but you can't touch him. And I, I love that uh, when you're watching this um, opening sequence. And it, it's a dirty black and white. The ring is dirty. Yep. But he, for some reason, has this kind of grace 
you know, and I thought that was, it's a fantastic intro for a movie. I think it sums up so much about the film. One mm. is it's, it's seriousness, you know, yeah. with that, that music Two is the reverence for the actual filming of the forties, you know, like they, mm -hmm. they, he really looked at tons of photographs of boxers from this era. Yeah. It has that reference for that. I also think there's a, there's a loneliness in yeah. the shot, yeah. you know, and, 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 and in particular, and this is, is the loneliness of the boxer who has to train for the fight, you know, yeah. like the, it's not what happens in the ring. It's everything else around it that yeah. leads him to be able to be this person, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, the DP is Michael Chapman, who did a bunch of uh, Scorsese stuff and he hit what he is doing. He's not running the camera. Yeah. He is wrapped entirely in black. And he has the flash bulbs and he is sneaking around behind the audience, setting off those flashes wow. and he's wrapped, wrapped all in black. So you can't see him because he, he just disappears. And I just think that's so funny. Yeah. And, and it just goes to like the, the artistry of the film, like him going, no, when these bulbs go off and where these bulbs go off is important, you know? Yeah. So smart, man. Um, what I had forgotten, you know, we talked about he worked on The Last Waltz and that then Robbie Robertson moved in with him. I yeah. forgot that he was the music supervisor of this film, that he really put together the music for this. Oh, wow. And then we see New York, 1964. We see a sign for an evening with Jake LaMotta. And then we hear this voice say, I remember those chairs. They still ring in my ears. And for years, they remain in my thoughts. Because one night, I took off my robe and what I do, I forgot to wear shorts. And we cut to fat Robert De Niro playing <laughs> older Jake LaMotta. I love the way Scorsese is already telling you with Thelma Schoonmaker how this film is going to be cut and edited. It's quick shots, 1964, quick shots, watching him do his monologue, quick shots to his face. And then quick shots, which we'll get to, to a younger man in the ring. I love this vibe. And it gives that feeling of 1940s documentaries. So if you've seen these, and then in the 1980s, you would have seen these films, right? You would have been had some kind of exposure to them. And I love the way he's cutting the film to make it feel that way. It's a genius move that puts you back in time combined with the black and white, you know? What do you think the reaction would have been to you as a moviegoer in 1980 yeah. seeing this fat Robert De Niro at this moment. Well, I think if I was an adult, that's what I, I mean. At yeah. that time, I think I would have been like, what is this? Right. Cause I mean, this is not a time where you would have had 500 stories in the press about De Niro gaining 50 pounds just for a couple of scenes in the or a few scenes in the movie, right? There was talk about it after the film came out, certainly, but not like it would have been nowadays. So I think it would have been a a stark um, reaction in in the theater seeing something like that and wondering what it's leading to and what this movie is even all about, you know? Because we just saw this skinny guy boxing in the ring or dancing around the ring. Now we cut to this older guy who is sitting here with trying to recite his monologue combined with some Shakespeare phrases. You know, what's interesting to me, like you mentioned the Godfather, the Godfather is such a romantic film in, mm -hmm. its, in its way. It's so everybody in it is intelligent and elegant and interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then you have this guy and, and, and you know, I'm always fascinated by a brilliant actor yeah. acting badly, you know, mm -hmm. like it's not the way that he delivers the line, just the way he emphasizes it. He's yeah. very clearly not that great at this. You know, yeah, it's yeah. and he doesn't look that good. <laughs> you know, he right. looks. Right. It doesn't make you feel you go like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. Though I'd much, though I'd rather hear you cheer when you delve. When I, though I'd rather hear you cheer when I delve into Shakespeare. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. I haven't had a winner in six months. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I you can feel that Jake LaMotta hired a guy yeah. to write this stuff for him. Yeah. And the material itself is bad. And then he's delivering it poorly. Yeah. It's just like, what, a, what am I watching? Because I didn't know anything about Jake LaMotta, you know? Right. And what is it, 1964 when he's doing the What's the year that yeah. he's doing? This, this is 64. Yeah, 64. This is only 10 years 
after he retired from boxing. Ten years later, he's doing something like this. And look, the the if you study old boxers, it is littered with um, a- incredible athletes who won titles at the height of their fame and who squandered all their money yep. and ended up being like greeters in Vegas or yep. things like that. It is only recently that athletes have really embraced the idea of you know planning for the future, having multiple revenue streams, investing. This is all very recent over the last couple of decades. Um, and certainly back then, it really wasn't something that a lot of boxers did. Um, and certainly a boxer like Jake LaMotta, as opposed to someone like Jim J. Braddock in, uh, in, um, in The Cinderella Man, he isn't going to necessarily have like this big groundswell of public of people in the public who want to help him because of his run-ins with the law his attitude his as we see in the movie so you know ending up doing and being a nightclub act for a strip club or whatever seems to be something that he would do um but it clearly his desire to be on stage his desire to be oh yeah the center of attention is still very much there and let me tell you as a retired actor that scene has, uh, oh, no, how can I say this? As an actor, and then as a retired actor, that scene has always fucked me up since the first time I saw the movie, because that is always every actor's, I think it's every actor's greatest fear, is to never make it, and to be so desperate to be on stage that you'll do anything like something like this at a strip club just to be on the stage. And so I see that as like a cautionary tale here and I love that um, Scorsese cuts to the close up of Lamada's face yeah. as he's staring at the camera, and the close up of his face shows you that this is a guy who is not happy with how his life turned out, but he's trying to make the best of it in some clumsy, awkward way. You know, saying that De Niro is a brave actor is such an understatement because oh. <laughs> he is so. And starting the movie this way, yeah, is I am so willing unlike a quote unquote movie star. Yeah. I look terrible, you know, yeah. and, and I'm delivering this in a way that isn't, it is not good how he's delivering this. I love that he messes it up. You know, that yeah. he says, no, I'm no Olivier. I would much rather. And though I'm no Olivier, if you fought Sugar Ray, he would say that the thing ain't the ring is to play. Which is an interesting thing for a guy whose whole existence was defined in the ring, you right. know? Right, right, hundred percent. By the way, I think this is what inspired Mike Tyson later in life to do a one-man show, which he traveled or which he toured with uh, all over the globe. A one-man show talking about his life and his experiences. I think Raging Bull and seeing what Lamada did um, was one of the inspirations for him doing it, um, which was, I think, just a couple of three or four years ago. Mm. Well, and you know. Going all the way back to Jack Johnson, when he got banned right. from boxing, he right. he went and did performances too. Mm-hmm. So give me a stage where there's bullhick and rage, and though I can fight, I'd much rather recite. And there's a pause, and he puts his arms out and says, That's entertainment. That's entertainment. <laughs> so, by the way, originally, there was a, the whole movie was supposed to be intercut with these sequences of him in the 60s. Oh, and then it was going to be flashbacks and they shot them and they cut it that way. And they went basically, this is what Scorsese said. Yeah. I didn't like cutting back to fat Jake. It just ruined, you know, like it just took you out of the movie in this way. It didn't inform the movie. It took you out of the movie. And so it became these bookends instead. Wow. We see again, that close shot of his face and it's Jake LaMotta in 1964. And then we cut right into young Jake LaMotta and it says Jake LaMotta 1941 and immediately two punches to the face. That's entertainment. Jake LaMotta and Jimmy Reeves in the Cleveland arena. LaMotta is undefeated, but he's well behind on points. What do you think of this transition? What does it mean? I guess is really my question. Well, I mean, for me, I've always taken it as um, both versions of Jake are entertain are um, putting their themselves out on the line for audiences to react to, ridicule, or cheer. And uh, we see the difference of what happens in 23 years to Jake LaMotta from this moment when he's n- nice and thin, you know? And so, again, it's a bit of a cautionary tale 
which is really surprising for the age that Scorsese was at when he was making this movie. But maybe, you know, this is, as I said, coming out of an addiction, coming out of these things, like this is um, him reflecting back on his life, possibly re- looking at a decision. We talked about in our Scorsese conversation about his upbringing and the people he knew around this area, around this time. And so we're seeing here, and I think in this opening, we're seeing that we're going to get this young guy with all this promise and what he's going to become at some point. But either way, the actor or the boxer are both on stage for the audience to cheer or to jeer at, you know? Agreed. And by the way, man, De Niro looks great. Yeah, I, mean, as, I was thinking that too when I was watching the movie. I was like, Jesus Christ. You know? I mean, as as bad as he looks in the 60s, he is yeah. in un, – un, you could just feel the the vitality and the, and the great shape just yeah. pouring off of him in this scene. And the round ends. Um, by the way, all the fight choreography was worked out by Robert De Niro and Jake LaMotta. Jake LaMotta was on the set for all of this stuff. Wow. He had tra- helped train De Niro. Some of the guys who are in the corner are actually Jake LaMotta's trainers from back oh. in the day. All the boxers he fights in this film are real boxers. Yep. The, the refs, the judges, the ring men, all those people, they're real boxing people. And they go, they've done the choreography and they call up Marty and say, hey, come on into the gym. We want to show you the choreography we worked on. So Marty's sitting outside the ring. Jake and De Niro or whoever he's working with are going through all the choreography and Marty's just not saying anything. Mm. And De Niro goes, Hey, what, you know, we're killing ourselves up here. Like, what do you, <laughs> you know, what do you think? And, and, and Marty said he was just totally stunned yeah. and he realized, I mean, this is, you know, an experienced filmmaker at this point, he's been making movies a long time. He's looking at this fight and he goes, I literally have no idea how to shoot two people in the ring. I don't I don't have any idea how I'm going to deal with this at all. Nothing in his experience prepared him for what he had to shoot. So he calls up one of his filmmaking buddies, Brian De Palma, and says, of course, it says, hey, I don't know how to shoot this thing in the ring. I don't know how to approach it. What do I do? And De Palma's words to him were, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Keep Bobby fat. I'm going to need him in seven years for untouchables. Keep him There fat. you go. There you go. Um so, you know, we've done a bunch of sports movies and whenever yeah. we do sports movies or anything where there's a skill, you always hear, oh, this actor was a natural baseball player, a natural gunslinger, a natural whatever. They're so good at it, they could be a professional. And whether or not that's true, I don't know. But I do know that De Niro actually competed in three boxing matches in Brooklyn. Wow. Like signed up and he won two out of three. Huh. Not too bad. Want to know what Jake LaMotta said about De Niro as a boxer? <laughs> Sure. What is he? <laughs> he said he's the he would he would be one of the twenty best middleweights of all time. Wow. Now I don't know how to take that at all. I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm top twenty in any uh, weight class is incredible. Ever? He's saying ever, not at the time. I just he wow. says of all time. Yeah. All time. Now, but this you know, Jake Lamada, and it's funny. So one of the commentary tracks on the disc on yeah. the Blu-ray disc is Jake Lamada. That's awesome. And. It's a lot of a lot, <laughs> as you would imagine. There's some moments in the commentary where, like, oh, he really has some perspective on this, and he's he has mature. There's another point which we'll get to where he just goes off, just oh, really? just full full crazy on the commentary track. Wow! Uh, all these fight scenes were sh- filmed in studios in L.A. Uh-huh. Um, it was scheduled for five weeks to shoot the fight scenes. It took ten weeks, double the time. Yeah. There are nine minutes of fights in the film. Yes, total. Total. Yeah. yeah. Ten weeks of filming, nine minutes of film. But, I mean, worth it. Yeah. You know? I mean, look, he put on 50 pounds for, what, two, three scenes? I mean, this is, uh, this is what you commit to when you're an actor, man, being a part of this. Jack, tell me why. Why the fuck do we have to come to Cleveland for you to get beat by a million yards? And there we see Joe Pesci is his brother Joey. And Joe Pesci had pretty much given up on acting at this point. So we, we talked about this a little bit in Goodfellas is that he had been a musician. He had had a stand up comedy act with Frank Vincent. Yeah. He had uh, acted in this one movie, which De Niro had seen him in that movie yeah. with Frank Vincent. And they couldn't find anyone to play Joey. And he calls up Scorsese and says, we should see this guy. But Joe Pesci is like, I'm kind of done with acting. And it sounds like from what I've heard, his whole career He's been sort of like, I don't know if I really want to do this, you know, yeah. 
he was working at an Italian restaurant in New Jersey as a waiter. And De Niro and Scorsese go to eat at the restaurant. That's how they meet him. <laughs> they brought him into an audition and he sold it in the room, you know? He's an important guy to this movie. Um, and to, you know, obviously to the world of acting as well. But like, he is the third part that is necessary for all of these great, a lot of these great collaborations between De Niro and Scorsese, right? I mean, Goodfellas, he's essential. I think he's essential in The Irishman, in this film. And so it's fascinating to watch these, um, this, how Pesci's role in all of this. And as you said, he's constantly having to be convinced to come back and be a part of it. But he brings along Frank Vincent into this situation here in Raging Bull. And and I will get to the other one, I'm sure, when we get to a certain actor who is a part actress who's a part of this. But like it's an important it's amazing how these little things that you do can lead to these results. And as we've talked about many times with films, there's a lot of happy accidents that you don't see coming that result in some positive end results for the film overall, which feels like it was, it was supposed to be like Kismet, you know? And so Pesci, I think is an essential part of this film being successful when you look at his contributions overall, not just as an actor. I totally agree. And I think, I think one of the ingredients that you need both to work with Scorsese and to work with De Niro, there's a certain fearlessness yeah. you have to have. Like you can't be, you know, frail or going to back down. And what they said from his audition and De Niro, Marty likes his actors to be there for auditions. So De Niro is there for, and it's his project too. Right. So De Niro is there and that Pesci was never intimidated here. You're working across the guys already won the Oscar for Godfather two. He's a huge star, one of the great actors. And you're a no, you know, you acted in one movie yeah, you're yeah. Working in an Italian restaurant. You get called in for this big part in an important film and Pesci's not intimidated at all. He gives as good as he gets, you know. Um, and by the way, there's a staff who gets the part. He goes and actually meets the real um, Joe LaMotta. Oh. And Joe LaMotta walks into the room, doesn't say anything to Pesci, starts circling him, like just studying him, <laughs> you know. And finally, Pesci looks at him and goes, look, they tried to get Robert Redford, but he was busy, so I'm playing you. <laughs> <laughs> You son of a bitch. I love it. Pesci's from the streets, man. Pesci yeah. gets it. That's why he's not intimidated by this thing. I want you to bite him, kick him, do anything you gotta do. Fuck out. You understand? Knock him out. And hey, you wanna go in there? You wanna go in there? Dude? And there's like a scream in the audience, yeah. which I love. And the you know, and the audience is sort of in chaos as the camera whip pans around to it. I think I think the way he creates these environments is so cool mm -hmm. and powerful. There's a great shot. It starts behind his opponent and then it moves around him. They touch gloves and Lamada just bores into him, just drives into him. There's a one, two hook. He goes down with flash bulbs and then he gets up and he goes down again. And everyone, the crowd is cheering. Everyone is cheering. The, he just beats him to a pulp left of the jaw down for the third time. The ref comes in, starts the count. Gets to nine, and the bell hits just at nine. Between us, there is the bell. Reeves has been saved by the bell. It's just done so perfectly. Yeah. And the announcement is Lamada loses. He's lost his first fight. Yeah. The crowd is furious because they saw who won. My favorite shot is the shot of the ref going to Reeves in the corner and lifting his hand and Reeves starting to stand up as the champion and then plops back down in the yeah. chair because he can't stand. It's a great sequence of events. As you said, the timing of everything works so well. And it already puts you in the mindset that this guy is a self-destructive guy, right? Because Joey is saying, you took too long. You took too long. Why didn't you react earlier? You know, and so there's a feeling here that Jake is his own worst enemy right off the bat. And it's a, it's a kind of subtle thing, and you could and and I think you could look him back on it after you watch the movie and see these these little seeds that Scorsese and the screenwriters are planting here with this with a sequence like this, you know, because he could have reacted earlier and beat this guy, and clearly because the way it's shot, he's completely controls that round and almost fully knocks him out. 
And so then, yeah, the kind of look that the boxer gives to the ref, like, what the fuck? And then <laughs> the kind of trying to get up, but clearly can't get up because he's still dizzy and sits back down, I think is great. But but Joey, but like, you stay here. You let him leave. You stay here. This kind of thing. And what it leads to in the audience, it's a funny thing because boxing audiences, people showed up and women showed up like in their nice dresses. Dudes showed up in their je- in their shirts and ties. And yet they'd have these like crazy fucking fights in the audience during these battle, during these fights, uh, fight um, fights, because people were all caught up in the um, feeling of it all. And so they'd get into it with each other, which of course still happens nowadays, Steve. It's just nobody wears suits and ties to go to these things anymore. But they're just they not do. as formal. They're not as stylish. Is that, um, is that, yeah. Well, we've lost that. The little class. Well, and I think it does such a good job of introducing you into this very unsafe world. Yes. Like, this, is a, this is a world where shit's going to go down. And the audience is going nuts. Chairs are getting thrown. Jake is standing in the ring. He throws that great leopard uh, robe into the ring. And he's because he's like, you know, I won. Yeah. Then, you know, and people are screaming. And I love, I love that the, the ring announcer, whoever gets the organist to start <laughs> playing the national anthem. And then you have this crazy shot of a dude getting thrown out of the ring into the crowd. It's just total, total chaos. And then we cut to Hell's Kitchen it, while still hearing the sounds of the previous scene and where it says the Bronx, New York City, 1941. And to me, I don't know about you, this looks like the Bronx in 1941. It just is so real, oh, yeah. this shot. Yeah. Uh, which brings me to a question from, as we mentioned at the sh- top of the show, we have our Patreon and one of the uh, one of the tiers you can actually ask questions that we'll talk about in the show. This one comes from patron Adam McAllister, who says, okay. hi, Stephen John. How do you feel about this film being in black and white? I feel this is the perfect way to display the decades of the 40s and 50s. When doing research as well, I had no idea Marty chose this not only to display the timeline, but also to tone down the blood. When rewatching the film, the black and white makes Jake a lot less dark and unlikable compared to a guy like Rocky Balboa, the protagonist in his own story. Looking forward to your discussion on this film. Mm. So what do you think of the black and white? What effects do you think it has? And do you think, do you think it makes it less dark or violent? No, I think it, I think it does make it less dark and violent because films back then weren't as dark and violent as they are now or were, or, in the it could have been in the 1980s so yeah i think it's a smart choice it also puts you in that time frame because you're used to again this is 1980 this is not nowadays where like you can see black and white film colorized from the 1950s and 40s in these military documentaries and you can see what london looks like in the 1920s in color um this is a different time and so for him in in the 19 late 1970s 80s to shooting black and white i thought was genius and it puts you in that feeling like oh this is a far off time this is a time in the past right and so there's a different connotation you have in your mind different expectation subconsciously when you watch a black and white film of what it's going to show you and i would imagine a lot of people in 1980 who were adults had seen some of these boxing films from the 1940s and 1950s kirk douglas with champion uh, robert ryan had an awesome one the setup there's, there was a lot of great boxing films that were a big deal in the 1950s and 40s and slightly in the 60s. So there is that vibe of like, okay, we're going back to something else that we know, but through a different point of view or different set of lenses. And so I thought, I, I think it's brilliant to use the black and white. So the black and white to me is, is it is critical for Raging Bull. It is, mm-hmm. it is, it is so perfectly, this is what Raging Bull is. Yeah. I obviously think it, it, it sets the time period beautifully. It looks amazing. Where I will disagree with the comment Hmm. I think the black and white makes it more violent and more visceral oh, really? for me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Particularly some of those later scenes with, with Sugar Ray, what we're going to see. It's like I feel the pain and the blood and all that stuff far more in this film than I do in Rocky. You know? I mean, right. it's just, they're just so di- I don't know. that that But, but well, Rocky, Rocky is hyper stylized. Like, yeah. I think it's a because di- nobody puts their hands up to defend themselves. You know? <laughs> no. So it just becomes a bit ridiculous. It becomes cartoonish or comic book superhero type like. Yeah. And so you don't necessarily, you know, feel that as deeply, which is why I mean the which is what I said at the beginning of the, our conversation, Steve, because he makes it so intimate this film, it puts yeah. you so close to these people, like you said later on in the film when you're seeing that the same Valentine's Day massacre, the Sugar Ray Robinson fight, it is horrific to see the beating yeah. he is willing to take 
for his own stubborn ego and his own maybe self-destructive impulses to punish himself for his negative actions. And uh, it is stark when you see it and the blood dripping off the ring rope, all of that. So, yeah. You, you know what it is? Because it's so funny. They're, they're so similar in some ways. They are mm. tough guys from sure. the streets. And they both, they're, both of them have the superpower of, I'm not going to go down. I can take punishment. Tough you know? Yeah. Yeah. But the difference is Rocky structurally is so clear. I just want to go the distance and we're going to test his courage. Right. And that's what the film is about. And because he is able to go to the distance, it's satisfying and we win and it's a triumph. You know what I mean? Yeah. This movie is like, what is going on inside of Jake that makes him want to take, it's not simple and clear like Rocky is. Well, I know nowadays we have this phrase that we use and stay with me, everybody. Don't, don't veer off and run off the rails, but the idea of toxic masculinity, right? We have always known what that is, and especially artists and creatives have known what toxic masculinity is, and at times have portrayed it in films, even in the 1970s, 60s, 50s, 40s, what have you. Here is, if you compare Rocky to Jake Lamont, and obviously one's a real person, one isn't, but as in terms of characters in films, Lamont is absolutely toxic masculinity. He is all anger, yeah. rage, passion violence, ego, paranoia. Rocky is vulnerable. Rocky yeah. is emotional. Rocky Sweet. is accepting. Rocky is forgiving. Rocky is a progressive male. And that's the difference, right? Rocky cares about Adrian. Rocky courts Adrian. Yes, that scene and you can have, you know, questions about whether he traps her in that apartment and convinces her or whatever. But like, I, I can understand that. But Rocky is a guy who cares. Mickey comes up there and Rocky unleashes the anger on Mickey, but it's from a place of hurt, not hate, right? When De Niro, when uh, Lamada is yelling at Joey about his wife, or when Lamada is, we're about to see, yelling at his wife about the steak and whatever, that's from a place of anger and hate. There's a difference. One is reaching out in vulnerability, in ra even in his rage or anger. The other one is reaching out to destroy, right? One is being, one is reaching out to, under to be understood. One is reaching out to destroy. And there's a difference in those two approaches. And I think that's where you see the difference between the two male leads of these movies, um, which is why Rocky is much more beloved than Jake yeah. LaMotta as a character. You know? Well, in the end, Rocky, A, he's kind of a complete person. You yes. Know? And he has his struggles in each of each of the movies, whereas Jake, Jake's power comes from the fact that he's a broken person. Yes. You know? Yes. His power comes from pain and jealousy and anger and insecurity right. and all these other things. That's not where Rocky's power comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are walking along the streets in Hell's Kitchen. Fantastic shot. And so funny, like, unlike you think of the giant shot at the at the Festa in Godfather 2, mm. you know, where Coppola had six blocks that he had to make up. This is like tiny, tiny frame. And yet it is 100% convincing of the era that we're at that right time frame. And we are walking with Frank Vincent, who you yeah. saw, it's so crazy to me seeing him without the gray white hair, <laughs> you know, because that is so, that is his iconic feature. Yeah. Um, and the only reason he gets cast is because of Joe Pesci, because right. he's, he was, you know, Joe Pesci brings him in and you just think about, wow, this incredible ingredient to Scorsese's world mm -hmm. gets introduced through Joe Pesci. Yeah. And they're basically talking about. That shit would have never happened if Tommy was over there taking care of it. I mean, you know he's got to be with Tommy to fight in New York to get a title shot. I mean, he's going to wind up fucking punch drunk, your brother. I know. So that is the plot of the movie on some level. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and, and if this were a normal film, it would be like, okay, this is about does he take the dive or does he not? Does he work with the mob or does he not? And that's right. in this movie. Right. But that is not what this movie is. Jesus Christ, you don't want to stop? When the fuck are you going to stop with all that stuff? I told you. I understand everything. He just wants to do things for himself. That's all. Hard to understand? That's because he's got a head like concrete. I can't even begin to imagine the level of Joey's frustration with his brother, you know? Uh, and I love Frank Vincent being a part of this. I mean, look, uh, the guy is always somebody that Joe Pesci beats up in his films, which is know, funny right? to me because they were they had a three man comedy act. Yes, I said comedy, three man comedy act. That's what they did. Um, but clearly, Frank has no problem, you know, playing these kinds of characters in these Scorsese movies because he's never the good one. He's always no. the ridiculed one. 
uh, or beat up one like Billy Bats. So it's it's an interesting decision by him to do it. But yeah, you see right off the bat, they're back and forth, their interactions, they have a rhythm with each other that is great to witness when you're watching it, man. By the way, do you know what his last name in is in this movie? No, what is it? His name is Salvatore Salvi Bats. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love I know, it. right? I mean, just so bizarre. You make me laugh. You think it's easy? Why don't you talk to him? You know what to say. Tell him. You know I can't talk to him. Well, why can't you talk to him? Because he don't like me. Yeah, nobody likes you. You ought to be used to that. We're inside. Jake is eating at a table. By the way, almost all of this is shot in real locations, and all of the real locations are small. We're yeah. always throughout this whole film, except when we're in a ring, we're going to be in confined spaces. Yeah. There's always going to be things obscuring us. There's always going to be walls closing in. And a part of this means they didn't have a lot of room for lights. They didn't have a lot of room for cameras. They didn't have a lot of room for any of that stuff because they're shooting in these really tight spaces. And I think that's part of the, the movie. I know. I know who's the boss. The judges didn't know. Who knows what happened with them? The people know. The fact that he says, I know who's the boss. And what does he say at the very end of the film to psych himself up to go up on stage? He says, I'm the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the yeah. boss. Which is something Jake LaMotta really said before going to fight. There's so much of this movie that is Jake trying to control a world he can't control. And there's so much of this movie trying to get Jake trying to control himself. Yeah. and Which he can't control. Yeah. yeah. And he looks up and the camera pushes in on his first wife. And, and Scorsese does this a lot in this film, is things that are just slightly slow. So this was probably shot at 36 frames a second instead of 24 mm -hmm. frames a second. So it's a it's a little bit slower. This right. is Lorianne Flax. He, this is his first wife. He married her because she was pregnant. And you could see just from the push in and the look that she gives him yeah. everything you need to know about this relationship. Yeah. I think this actress does a wonderful job yeah. and didn't do anything else after this. Wow. And I don't understand um, because she's incredible in this scene with her and De Niro, uh, and has a great look, good voice. So, you know, I did some research on her as I was watching the movie, cause I like to have little things for these actors that are part yeah. of it, like little information. And there's not much on her, you know, hardly anything. I think she was on celebrity millionaire or hmm. who wants to be a millionaire back in 2012 as a contestant. Wow. There's no footage of it, but it's listed on a number of her bios. So if anybody knows what this woman has been doing since since Raging Bull, maybe post something or let us know in the Facebook group because I I thought she was wonderful here in this scene and I'm shocked that she's not in like every fucking Scorsese film. You, know? you thought I was fooling around, didn't you? Tell me the truth. I'm going to fool around. That's in your mind. Yeah. So what? There's so much of like I don't trust any of Jake's perceptions about reality yeah. at all. Yeah. Talk about um, unreliable narrator, man. Jesus. Yeah. And she's cooking a steak for him, and he goes, Is it done? No, it's not done. And I love this line. <laughs> Don't overcook it. Overcook it's no good. It defeats its own purpose. <laughs> it defeats its own purpose is one of those lines where it's like, I don't even, it's perfect. That's such a good line. <laughs> um, here's my question. Hmm. Is the steak overcooked? Uh, when she brings it out, it looks a little bit overcooked. I, I, to me, this is like a key thing because yeah. it's if it if she's a regular overcooker of steaks, it's very different from if she brings out a half raw steak. Right, right. It's like a piece of charcoal. Bring it over here. Okay. You want your steak? Yeah, right yeah. now. She brings it over on a just grabs it on a fork and dumps it in front of him. Happy, happy. That's all I want. That's, That's all I want. Here, not more. There. And then he just tosses that table over. Pardon me, about a steak, huh? You bought me by the steak? Yeah. I feel bad for every girlfriend I ever had, including the lady outlaw, who's ever made me a steak in a kitchen, because I have, without fail, walked into the kitchen and go, bring it over, you're burning it, what are you doing? <laughs> I've done the lines every single time, and I've gotten the dirtiest looks every single time, but it's a pleasure for me to, make, to do those lines, because I, I love this opening scene for him. Like Just like the opening boxing scene, here he is once again in his domestic life, right? It's a battle even in his domestic life uh, that he's not winning. Yeah, um, exactly. And, he, because yes. he just wants control. Right, because yeah. he wants to be things that he, but the problem is that he is such a fucking nut that everything he wants 
is changes from one second to the other. So no one will ever able, no one's ever able to satisfy him because he can't even satisfy himself. And so it's just, it's a fascinating exploration of these two scenes uh, right after the one right after the other. Well, it, I mean, I'm sure you've been in this situation where you're with someone who is determined to have a fight. You know, uh, I have been that someone. What are you talking about? I mean, like to my twenties and thirties and a little bit into my forties, I wasn't a self as self-aware of a person about my behavior as I became after therapy and after all that stuff that went on with me in, in the mid 2010s. And so like I would be paranoid. I would, I was absolutely a person who thought everybody hated me or was talking about me behind my back or that nobody really was supporting me or wanting me to succeed. So that was a very big deal. And even with relationships, because I was so unconfident, I would be nervous. Like I would be the person who's like, who are you talking to? Where'd you go? I never put my hands on anybody, right? I never went that far, but I certainly was always jealous and paranoid of any woman I ever dated. And that's why watching this film uh, was tough when I watched it at the time, because I didn't understand that I thought that was something distant, but watching it now, all these years later, I can see shades of myself in La Mata because that's always coming from a place of insecurity and a place of low self-worth, which is why you're paranoid because you don't think you have value enough for someone to stay around. So you're always afraid you're going to get fucked over. And like you said, Steve, you're trying to control the situation. So you think if you can catch them, if you can just catch them, then you're like, yeah, I knew I was right. And I'm a good, and I, and I, and I'm intelligent and I'm smart and I'm on top of things when in fact you're a paranoid uh, uh, moron. And those are the things that you have to confront, but it always comes from that place. So yeah, I mean, it's it's a terrible thing because you woo and you, ca- you care and you're interested. And then all of a sudden when they're with you, you're afraid of losing it. So it turns you into a paranoid person because you have such low self-worth and low insecurity or high insecurity, low self-worth, you know? Well, and it's like, if the steak, if she brings the steak over and it's cooked perfectly, yeah. then he's right that she was about to overcook it. And there's a fight. Mm-hmm. If the steak comes over and it's undercooked, then she's mad and she's going to start the fight. Like anyway, right. at this point, the yeah. fight is guaranteed because what he wants is the fight because what he wants is control. Right. You know, it's like he can't dominate. He lost in the ring because he didn't have control. And so right. now he will have control here. Um, by the way, apparently there were some very serious arguments in Marty Scors- Martin Scorsese's family kitchen and food often ended up on the walls. Uh, I'm going to say that's happened to me a couple of times as well <laughs> in, in, in a relationship and also with my family. So I'm just going to say that that is, that has happened. But I, I think this is the difference between me. I will say this right now. I'll let people know a little behind the scenes. Steve texted me about this movie and Steve was like, this is such an uncomfortable movie to watch yeah. and experience. And for me, having grown up with this kind of passionate anger from, numerous people in my family and from growing up in this guy like this is second nature to me this kind of thing is uncomfortable but it's it was kind of part of our family process and uh part of my extended family like my un- uncles and cousins there was always fights and battles and emotional explosions and storming outs and all that kind of stuff is is was standard growing up, which is why now when it happens in my life, I'm really kind of, I I get kind of traumatized by it because I've worked really hard not to have that be an element of my world. Uh, So yeah, so it's fascinating when I, so when I watch the movie, it's like going down memory lane a little bit and I don't, I don't feel as uncomfortable watching the movie as, as you do until we get to um, him beating up Joey. That's the, that's the fucking scene that destroys me every time in this film. Yeah, well, and I come from a fan, you know, mostly a family of Vulcans. I mean, like, Vulcans. like I remember when, when I first started, Karen and I first started dating, and I go to her house, and it's Italian and Irish, and they're uh, just yeah. screaming at each other, and I'm just sitting there so uncomfortable. I mean, it's it's so funny. Like, I remember I feel bad for my sister because she was the most emotional in my family, oh, yeah. and there was times where she was really upset, and it being emotional, and me, my mom, and my dad, the three Vulcans are all sitting there, like looking at her, going like. Kathy, why don't you sit down and let's, you know, you know it's just terrible. <laughs> like, the, don't you all get it? <laughs> you know, don't you? Under, yeah, I'm not. I'm I, I mean, you know me. I'm not comfortable in confrontations. I, don't, I, don't. I rarely lose my temper. Like there's one there is one time where I I physically broke something because I was so angry twice. No, it's twice. Mm, yeah. Twice. That's it. You know, like, I mean, yes, I punched a wall and things like that when I was in my 20s, you know, sure, stuff like sure. that. Yeah, but yeah. but like not 
at somebody before. Right. Initially, it was supposed to be the entire scene with Joey and Salvi walking in the street and the entire scene of, of them in the kitchen with the steak. And this is what you discover when you're editing is that for editorial reasons, it made more sense to cut back outside and see them walking up. I agree with you. We should be with Tommy. If he's in a good mood, I'll talk to him. What the fuck you want me to do? But this Joey, Tommy tells me every day to talk to you and speak to Jake to straighten this thing out. I mean, I'm going to wind up in the middle of this thing. You're in the middle. I'm his brother. He's got me fucking nuts. You're his brother. If you can't talk to him, who's going to talk to him? It's a great little, like, window into their relationship. Probably a meta window into their relationship uh, as friends, as actors, real life, and the characters themselves. So I like that moment. They say goodbye. We hear that they're going to be at the gym tomorrow. And he heads inside and walks right into the middle of the argument that has obviously escalated tremendously. Oh, wait, did you wait oh, that? Did you I got no that? choice. Oh, I'm sick of you I got no I can't choice. You. It, it's so funny. There's so much dialogue, which is, uh, it's not incidental. But it's not that you have mm. to really pay attention to every word. And it's almost like the tone of the argument is what you hear. Yeah. And he's advancing on her. He's got, yeah. like, you know, the wife beater. He's wearing the boxers. And it is scary. And he oh, grabs yeah. her by the head and pushes her. And it's very clear. This I agree with you. The actress is, is great because it's yeah. very clear to me in her reaction that he has hit her before. And she's right. scared. Right. Because you see her immediately change from this combative, fierce woman to this woman who's now afraid of what's going to happen to her physically because he grabs her by the back of her hair and she immediately cowers. Physically, immediately cowers, yeah. you know, because she knows what's coming, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, it's tough to watch. It, yeah, it, it really, well, and, and you're also going like, wait, this is my main character? Like, yeah, this is, good point. like, I met this fat guy in 1964 <laughs> and then I see this guy, you know, about the steak and, yeah. you know, it's, it's like, I don't, how do I feel about this? And then well, I love to, so the fight is going on, it's escalating. And one of the things Chris says he does, and it, now I see this is a thing he does all the time, mm. which is he sees an element or he sees a way to push a scene in a new direction. And he's not afraid to surprise his actors. So he goes, one of the things about where Scorsese says he grew up was you're in the, in the apartment building, you're in a yeah. small building, their neighbors, people overhear each other's fights, there's yelling. And so oh, he yeah. goes up to his prop guy and he pulls him outside the window and he says, I want you to yell in, uh, say, what's the matter with you up there, you animal? And I want you to use the word animal. And he didn't tell De Niro. So they're in the midst of this fight and he cues the prop guy to yell this. And De Niro, of course, without missing a beat, turns and start yelling at him. And it's great. <laughs> Hey, you! Come on, Jack. I'm gonna get hold of that dog and I'm gonna eat him for lunch. You hear what I'm saying? And he, so now he's angry at his wife. He's angry at this guy on the road. Joey's in there trying to settle things down. Um, and and this word "animal" is key to the movie. Yeah, because I mean, in in the scene that fucking wrecks me. I mean, like, what does he say yeah. later on in the film? I'm not an animal. I'm not an animal. Right, right, right. Which is funny because it's the same year. It I think 1980 is the same year as um, Elephant oh, Man. It is. Right? The same year. And I love, by the way, there's a very specific way that De Niro says, son of a bitch. Your mother's an animal, yeah. you son of a bitch. Oh. <laughs> and I love as they sit down. <laughs> There's this moment when the wife is just completely freaked out, just yeah. totally upset. And he sits down and then Jake starts smiling. And he says, come on, honey, let's be let's be friends. Truth, all right. Yeah. But this is, you know, and that's what's chilling about people like this is that they can make the switch. Uh, and all of a sudden act as if nothing just happened. And that's even scarier, honestly, because. That means they've got that gear and that switch, which most people take a long time to get to. Like you, Steve, like you said, like it takes a lot to make you really legitimately angry. For him, it is really second nature. So it's just like, bam, bam, going to anger and then going right back to being loving or sweet. That's just uh, how he is. And it's a very unsettling thing for most people to be around. 
So this was th- th- not all of these traits, but the trait of wanting the fight and then dropping out of the fight or messing with the fight. That was Karen's dad. And Karen's dad, I'd have these huge arguments with. And he, there was this one argument I had with him where he switched sides, middle of the argument, <laughs> and didn't realize he was doing it because he just wanted the fight. You know what I mean? Like right, he didn't right. he didn't actually have a strong opinion either way. And I'm like, what you you that was what you argued the op, 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 I couldn't, and I was so angry. Like you if you could have seen the smoke coming out of my ears. And then when he saw that he really gotten me angry. He yeah. made like a like a pouty silly face at me. Yes. Like, oh, are you mad? Mm, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. And I and I said, I think I said something like, Franklin, I would never hit you. But if I were to hit you, you would go down. Or something like that. Wow. It's one of the most threatening things I've ever said. Because I was just so fucking pissed. <laughs> There's gonna be two sounds. Me hitting you, <laughs> two, you, hitting so you me hitting you, you hitting the floor. You, exactly. you son of a bitch! <laughs> you son of a bitch! Yeah. Forget about the Reeves thing. You got a million other fights coming up. You just can't keep doing this. By the way, it's just... I, I Joe Pesci is an actor. Yeah. I it, Doing Goodfellas and then doing this. Mm. And I also, by the way, I recently rewatched Lethal Weapon, which I hadn't seen in a long time, which oh, yeah. is fantastic. And then I rewatched Lethal Weapon 2. Yeah. And if you compare Joe Pesci in Lethal Weapon 2 to Goodfellas and this film, it's what an amazing fucking actor. Well, it's, like I said, if you didn't know he'd been in a comedy act for all these years, like you, you would be so surprised. And you're right. A, a, so many of us at that time in the 80s, we're surprised when he's in Home Alone, when he's in Lethal Weapon, playing these comedic, g- big comedic characters. Even my cousin Vinny has a lot of comedic beats there that are played uh, for laughs or big or big laugh beats. And and it's Joe Pesci being a damn good comedian at the same time that he's a fantastic and chillingly fantastic dramatic actor. You know, for as good as Robin Williams was in. Uh, Goodwill Hunting, you could not see him play a character like this. No. Like Tommy or whatever. Like, yeah, sure, he came close in Insomnia and One Hour Photo, but never came to what you see in Goodfellas or in in Casino, for God's sakes. You know, so that's what makes Pesci such a fantastic uh, actor on so many levels. Uh, totally agree. And then there's like this long sort of awkward pause and he goes, Something's the matter. do you think the whole steak thing was really about his hands that that actually was what's bothering him in the first place no he's a guy who is an immature 10 year old who has no concept of how to be an adult human being with his emotions so for him he is just mad and he has no way to process it he's mad at himself for waiting too long to turn on the jets to beat reeves and now he's got to sit with his loss, his first loss ever. So nothing is good. And so everything must be destroyed. Everything must be uh, questioned. Because if he doesn't put it outwardly, he's going to have to put it inwardly. And he doesn't have the emotional capacity to handle that. So the steak is overcooked. Now this Tommy sit now with my hands. And then it's going to be Tommy about why are you talking to these guys? Or, or Joey, why are you talking to these guys? And so there's, there's all these things that are outside him, but it also shows you like the chilling level of mania this guy has, the idea that he could be obsessed with his hands. And some people are like that. Yeah. I am sort of fascinated by his hands. How, mm-hmm. how long has he been stewing about the fact that he's never going to be able to fight Joe Lewis and be the heavyweight champion of the world? Oh, I think it's been a thought in his head before. But because he just lost his first fight, now he's become obsessed with it, right? It's almost a form of like, what is it that um, Howard Hughes has in The Aviator when he's like 20 to OCD? OCD? Yeah. yeah. Obsessive compulsive, yeah. It's what he has. He has a, an L, a shade of OCD with this. Because once he focuses on something or once something grabs his mind, he won't let it go. And we see this throughout the movie. Like when we get to the stuff with Vicky... And he wakes her up and he's like, well, why'd you say he was good looking? Why'd you say that about this guy? Like, he becomes obsessed about this one thing. And it's always a thing that is detrimental to him. It's always a thing that is a negative about him. You know, someone is better looking than him or someone has better hands 
or someone is more successful or someone's uh, or he can't get to this person uh, because he wants to fight. He's created some fantasy and he said that he's going to fight Joe Lewis, but he comes up, obs- he becomes obsessed with it and it consumes his mind, which is why uh, Joey says to him, you got to let this go. You got to let this stuff go. And later on in the movie, when he's talking to him about Vicky, and his, he said, he, what is he? He says, either punch her in the mouth and kick her the fuck out or accept her for who she is and, and, and move on. Like you got to let this stuff go. But he doesn't know that his brother has this kind of OCD in his head and how he approaches things. A, I think OCD is a good way to put it. And I also think it, for me, it's important to point out that is also his superpower. You know, right. He is not oh. does not get to be middleweight champion of the world without this obsessive nature. Right. You know, because that's where the training is. That's what makes him keep standing up to these to this fucking punishment. That's what he he is. It's uh, at some point, Joey describes him as like block headed or concrete headed. Yeah. And I just and it's so funny, too, because I watching De Niro in this movie, you know, we've talked about the great uh, Daniel Day Lewis and we've talked sure, about sure. Uh, Meryl Streep and we talked about these people. But De Niro might be the best at behavior mm. and just right. like. Because we mostly think about acting. First of all, most people think about acting is when you say stuff. Right. And of course, you and I know that acting is also about actions and listening and all this stuff. De Niro in this film can be doing nothing or just turn his head and look at a thing. And it feels so completely real to me and grounded and filled with stuff. But and this is why I go back to the I don't know what it's filled with, but it feels so fucking real. And. And, and I do think, like, he is just now spinning on the hands. He's spinning yeah. on I'll Never Be he- the Heavyweight. And I am so Joey. But you're crazy to even think about something like that. I mean, he's a fucking heavyweight or a middleweight. It's impossible. It'll never happen. So why go crazy thinking about it? It's not normal. That's how I look at things. It's <laughs> like, I mean, I do move on from spilled milk upsettingly fast for some people. Yeah, I'm um, sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, 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 cause I'm, you know, it's like a big thing will happen and I'm like, well, okay, what are we, what are we going to do about it? And other people are like, no, I had, uh, and maybe I'll cut this out. My, yeah. one of my favorite famous stories with my friend, Steve Jones, we were going to a taqueria in Berkeley. I had driven us there. we had all talked about how excited we were to get some burritos. We pulled up, the taqueria was closed and I went, okay, well we could go to cactus taqueria over on Shattuck or we could go to this El Sombrero. And Steve went, stop, stop, stop. Can't we just mourn for a minute? For the taqueria, like, can't we just take a moment to like before we move oh, on? Jones, <laughs> it, it was a great, but it was a great lesson for me because I went like, oh, my emotional process, which is very thin. <laughs> other people have to have their emotional process. They have to go. It's a big thing with my kid because yeah. he has big reactions, and frequently I'm saying, "He's a heavyweight. You're a middleweight. This is impossible. It's never going to happen. Why are you upset about it?" <laughs> But he's really, really upset about it, and we have to deal with that. Yeah. Do me a favor. Yeah. Why don't you hit me in the face? What? So he's gone from, they. I'm really the boss, but they gave the win to the other guy who I knocked out. Right, right. To, the steak is undercooked. To, shut up, you animal. I'm not an animal. You're the animal. To, my hands are too small to be heavyweight. To... I want you to hit me in the face. Mm. I there's a there's a line here, you know, of connections. Yeah. Like he he feels lesser than, and now he needs to prove that he's not. Mm-hmm. And of course, Joey doesn't want to do it, and he you know he takes all the tactics. He says, "What are you afraid of?" He calls him a faggot. He's there's there's lots of improv in this shot, by the way, and and it's shot really simply. It's just you know over the shoulders, or two or singles. But when you're doing all this improv, when people are interrupting each other and you only have one camera, it's Mm. super hard to edit because nothing matches perfectly. And so figuring out how to put it together is very hard. Come on, Jack. You're going to be a real jerk when I'm going to punch you in the face. Hey, Joey, did I not tell you just to do it? Now I'm telling you, you got to do it. I ain't hitting you. Hey, I'm your little brother, Joey. I'm telling you something. I know what you said. I ain't doing it. And I think... He he's starting to win. Like he might get out of this room without punching his brother. And then he says, I don't have any gloves anyway. We're gonna hit you with table. That opened up a window of maybe that was enough for him to push through, make some grab a dish towel, 
wrap it around his hands, and they stand in this over-the-shoulder fist cock, and he hits him. Hot. Yeah? You throw a punch like you take it up the ass. Come on. Harder. 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 How do you feel about this sequence? This is, again, another extension of um, his personality. And it's giving us a window into who he is even more so, right? Because, like I said, at the beginning here with the fight, well, at the beginning when he's doing the monologue, we see this is where he ends up, you know, at a, working at this CD bar and doing this kind of thing. And then uh, when we go to him, he is self-destructive. And the fact that he doesn't get re- doesn't turn on the Jets in time to defeat this guy. Then he goes after his wife for the steak. Then he goes after uh, t- uh, Joey for, um, you know, coming with the hands situation. And now he wants to have Joey punch him. Why? Because there is an impulse within Jake LaMotta. And that happens throughout the movie. There are little moments, if you catch him, where he knows there's something is wrong with him. He just can't figure out what it is. So in his own fucked up, weird kind of atoning or balancing the universe way, he thinks he wants Tommy to punch him to punish him because he knows he's not going to beat Tommy up and he trusts Tommy and he loves uh, Scott. Damn, I keep saying Tommy and he loves Joey. He, He cares about Joey. So Joey is the one person who has the latitude to punish him and he will take the punishment because of their, uh, connection as brothers. And so he tells him, you punch, punch me in the face, punch me in the face. And so he gets him to do it by slapping him, calling him the F word, those things to get him to punch him in the face. But Jake Lamont is punishing himself for having lost the fight to Reeves. And Joey's the one punching because Joey's the one that tells him in the ring, you waited too long. So in a way, this is Jake punishing himself, beating himself for um, not having been, um, uh, not having done better in that fight. So, and some people like that. Some people, like in some messed up way, want other people to punish them uh, for their uh, mistakes or what have you. I think, I I think that's a hundred percent true. And I think yeah. the other truth for me is the one thing he can do is take punishment. That's yes. the one thing that he knows he's good at, yep. and so he's returning there to reestablish within himself. I still am who I am. You know, yeah, yeah. you can't hurt me. And, and, and he pushes, keeps pushing his brother. Cause you know, you could tell like at first he's punching him hard ish, yeah. then a little harder. And then he keeps pushing his brother. He slaps him. He insults yeah. him until he gets angry and now really starts to hit him. Right. Yes. What the fuck? What do you Take want? It Take it off. Ah, oh, come on. You want to stop now? Take That's enough. That's Come on. And, and I think De Niro plays the I just got hit, but you didn't hurt me just so perfectly in this, you know. Yeah. It's enough. Yeah. It's, it's enough. Yeah. Hard, hard. Nah, your fucking cuts are opening and everything. What are you trying to prove? What does it prove? I think what does it prove is an important question in the whole yeah. movie. And you can also see that his wife is watching him like through a crack in the door for all of this. It's a great and, shot yeah. to see her just because what you imagine is probably a horrified look on her face that this is the man she's married to. Yeah. Because, and, well, and this is the thing, you know, like we had conversations about Goodfellas a lot about mm-hmm. good people or honorable people, or are they being honorable as thieves or are they to, you know, adhering right. to a code? We're not in that world at all anymore. Jake is Jake, you know, yeah. Jake is not in control of himself. He's not making rational decisions for ethical reasons. We're not on an ethical balance sheet here yeah. of codes and things. Jake is Jake, you know, yeah. and everybody who lives with him is living with him, you know. Yeah, and all of him. Yeah, all of him. Yeah, yeah. and and that is a person who is not in control. You yeah. know, uh, we're at the gym, and you know they're sparring, and Joey's got all the pads on. And Joey invited Sal to the gym. You don't come up here. Answer me when I talk to you. Yeah, why? Can't my friends up here? Don't ever bring them up here with him. And then he hits Joey and he goes at him more seriously and starts beating on him. And there's a moment where Joe Pesci goes, oof, and you hear it. And that is the moment that Robert De Niro broke Joe Pesci's rib. Yep, and legitimately did break it, too. Yeah. <laughs> What the fuck is wrong with you, huh? You're gonna make a fucking jerk out of me. They only came up here because Tommy told him to come up and try to help us. What's the matter with you? Help who? What's the matter with you? 
I don't know. I'll be taking my money. So we're just talking about taking my money. I'm here breaking my ass. Not done. Don't ever bring him up here again. You hear me? Why do you think Jake is so resistant to Tommy Como? Oh, I think because Jake has this belief that he can do it himself. And uh, he doesn't want anybody's help because he doesn't want to be holden to anybody. You know, he, he hasn't, he has this attraction to the nobility of doing it himself. You know, we cut to kids on a rooftop. Again, this just feels like the neighborhood. And I love mm -hmm. as the camera tracks down that we see kids jump off of like the second story or the second story window into the pool. Yeah. It just feels like a perfect slice of life of this area. Jake is there ordering a Coke. Joey's there. He's talking to someone. And then we reveal Vicky, played by Kathy Moriarty. Hmm. First of all, she, she's just stunning, you know? She's gorgeous. I think she's like 20 years old when she's yeah. making this movie. Yeah. So uh, Marty says he thought she was 16 when she was making this movie. She was, she was 19, 18 when she was cast. She, this is her first film. She'd done a few like high school plays. I think she had done a little dinner theater. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely clear how this happened. What I think happened is that Joe Pesci, again, he's the reason that she's in this movie. So he brings in both Frank Vincent and Kathy Moriarty. He saw her photo somewhere. Again, well, well, yeah, maybe you know. Yeah, what happened was she, um, and she spoke about this in interviews. Uh, she, her friends like encouraged her to do bathing suit contests. Oh. And so she would, you know, go around the neighborhood because you know, she's, I think she's from Brooklyn or the Bronx and, uh, and do these things. Right. And so Pesci one night while he was cast in the film, um, before they started shooting and they were looking for a Vicky, went to one of these things, not knowing she was there. Right. Didn't, and never met her. And, um, she said that after sometimes after these events, guys would ask to take a picture of me and I would be like, yes or no. And I would stand there and take the picture. Well, this guy, I don't I have no idea who this is. This little guy comes up to me and he asks to take a picture. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So he takes the picture and apparently he took the picture of her with the intention to bring it to um, Scorsese and De Niro for her to play Vicky. And so he presented the picture to Scorsese and De Niro, they immediately loved her look. Uh, and that's how they ended up meeting with her and her auditioning for it and her getting the role. So as you said, you know, and as I alluded to earlier, Pesci is, an, is such an instrumental part of this film working because Kathy Moriarty is the perfect choice for Vicky LaMotta. And it's kind of crazy to think that she this is her first movie because she's so natural in the film. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, Pesci looking like He's not intimidated by working with De Niro. Kathy Moriarty is also in that boat when you're watching yep. the movie. And certainly there are moments where she's supposed to be intimidated by Jake, but that's different from the actress who's going toe to toe with Robert De Niro. And I think Kathy Moriarty uh, holds her own with everybody in this movie. She's great. 100% agree. Well, and the thing too, I just think about, okay, you maybe want to quit acting. You're working in an Italian restaurant in New yeah. Jersey. Yeah, yeah. You get cast in this part by these multi Academy award winning guys on this big movie. And you go, Hey, why don't you cast my buddy, Frank Vincent? And I saw this girl and I took a picture of her. You should cast her as the other lead. It's like yeah. the fearlessness of that is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Agreed. Um. So, and, and again, she read with De Niro in the auditions and it sounds like, first of all, it sounds kind of like De Niro did with her what he did with Jodie Foster and Taxi Driver, which is he really gave her acting lessons. And the big mm -hmm. thing that she said about De Niro was that he taught her how to listen. Mm. And I think that is an amazing, an amazing lesson for an actor. Um, the only problem was that she was not in the union. She's not in the Screen Actors Guild because she uh -huh. had no experience. So they want to cast her. Sis Corman is the casting director. Mm -hmm. She's worked with her and they go to the union and the union goes, sorry, she's not in the union. You can't cast her. And what they have to do is convince them to make an exception. And so they had to do two things. One is they had to show pictures and film, which they had of the actual Vicky yeah. and say, look, this is why this person is so special. And she had to show them some of the other auditions that she had to show. We can't find anyone else to play this part. And they finally convinced the Screen Actors Guild to make the exception. And that is how she ends up in the movie. Wow. What, one other point. Her hairdresser was Marilyn Monroe's hairdresser, I <laughs> think, from Seven Year Itch. Wow. 
Yeah, which makes and you could see her hair looks gorgeous. And it's her, her, her there's something about her face. It's she's absolutely beautiful, mm. but it's also totally her own face. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. She didn't look like anybody. I 100% agree with that. Who's that girl? Which one I was talking about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Vicky. Where's she from? She's from the neighborhood. She's a neighborhood girl. And we see that she is talking to Sal and those guys. She knows them. She knows them. They know her. She comes to the pool every day, and everybody knows each other. You know how that shit works. She go with them? She go with nobody. She's 15 years old. Where the fuck's she gonna go? You gonna take a couple of island? And you could see just the obsessiveness of Jake. Mm -hmm. like, Again, right? Yeah. yeah. She ain't the kind of girl you just fucking forget about. This. Joe, how many times I gotta tell you? Why are you always cursing when I'm talking to you? Don't do it around me. Put it around your friends. Dude, it's so bizarre just because <laughs> Jake curses all the time. Everybody curses in this movie. Like, yeah. why are you making a thing about this right now? You son of a bitch. <laughs> right. He <laughs> curses all the time. Yeah. Joe Banger? No. So, first of all, is that the truth? Had Joey had sex with Vicky. I don't think so. I, I actually don't think, think so either. Joey would, would tell his brother he had. I think he would, you yeah. know. Tell me the truth. I just told you the truth. I tell you the truth the first time. You don't have to ask me again. I never do that. I always tell you the truth. If I did it, you would know. Which is going to echo later on when essentially he asks him the same question yeah. and have the same, and that scene is fucking terrifying. That's the scene of the movie for me. Yeah. I took her out a couple of times. You want what? You didn't try to fuck her? I try to fuck anything. <laughs> she knew you were an animal. She knew it was no good if you go with her. The whole reputation be ruined. I love all that. <laughs> and then Vicky gets up and he, she goes to the pool and she sits down. She basks her face in the sun and he is just staring with that Jake LaMotta focused, intense stare. And he is looking at her legs as she splashes them in the water. It's slightly in slow motion. Things with water in slow motion are very important in this film. Mm -hmm. We see them many times. And I think there's something that uh, Scorsese said about Taxi Driver, which is that he wanted to show the world how he sees the world. Mm. And I think that he has these moments, and I do too, and I'm sure you have too, where you just focus in on a thing. Yeah. You know? Oh, 100%. Yeah. And I think that moment of her legs in the pool, in the water, in slow motion, just like all the other things we've seen Jake get obsessed about, this is his moment of obsession about yeah. this. And this becomes his most dangerous obsession. Absolutely. I think also what Scorsese wants to do is he wants you to fall in love with her too. Yes. So that when the things start to happen to her, you are invested in the horrible treatment that Jake is going to visit upon her later on. And so, yeah, so it's important for you to find her attractive, you to find her uh, um, someone that you want to know and someone that you want to care about. So the slow motion stuff, the way she moves, all of these things, the way she's dressed, the costuming of her character, all of it uh, is designed to make you immediately be like, whoa, who is this? And I like her, I'm interested in her, I care about her, yeah. From everything I've heard from all the interviews of people that knew Vicky or met Vicky, yeah, she w everyone described her as just unbelievably stunningly beautiful. Wow, like wow. just and I've seen pictures of her when she was young. Oh, yeah. She certainly was. Yeah, yeah. They're getting ready to go out in suits, and Irma, his wife, is having no part of it. And it's just I will go into all the details, but it is just her screaming at them in the apartment, in the hallway, down the stairs. They go out on the street. She leans out the window of the apartment and is screaming at them, just fucking irate. A lot of homophobic insults. There are definitely a lot of those. We see a sign that says there's a neighborhood dance, um, and we head inside to this club, and we go over to a table where there is John Turturro in his yes. very first film. Yes. I um, had never caught him before in the movie. And when I saw it this time around, I was like, wait a minute. I know that piece. Yeah. 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 This is his first movie ever. And he gets to, you know, sit at a table with Robert De Niro. Pretty cool. Pretty awesome. And we see that Jake LaMotta is a known person around town. Mm -hmm. The father is coming up. People are noticing him. One of the interesting things that I didn't catch but came up in one of the commentary tracks or something is that Joey has friends. 
Yeah. Joey actually exists in a social world. World. Jake doesn't. Mm-hmm. Jake is just alone. He's just in his apartment. He has Vicky. Yeah. He has his first wife. He has Joey. That's it. You know, he's a totally isolated person. It's like the opening of the movie, isolated yeah. in that ring. Yeah. And then as he's sitting there and he's talking to like a priest who's come over or something, <laughs> I think this moment, this is like the lightning bolt in Godfather. Mm-hmm. 100%. 100%. You're correct on that, Steve. He looks across the club and we see through the dancers. And we, and this is the thing, Scorsese as he loves to do in this film is watching things through obstructions is that we see her sitting at this table. She's in slow motion. She looks absolutely gorgeous. And of course, who is behind her, but Sal. Yeah. And that, so immediately I think locked it. When we first saw her at the pool, Sal was there. We now see her at this club. Sal's there. I think this is locking in to his jealousy right now. Yeah. And one of the things that shouldn't work and, but Martin Scorsese says he ma- makes work really well is mixing some things in slow motion, some things in regular motion. So he walks up in regular motion, but Sal and Vicky are still in slow motion. Right. And it's interesting too, as we walk through the club, there's a guy who's bleeding, who's obviously like been in a fight. Yeah. I think that's a fascinating detail. And we go outside and the music, by the way, is it's Bob Crosby's and the song is Big Noise from Win- Winnetka. And it is that whistling music as they get in the car and drive away in slow-mo. And there's something about that music that is fantastic. It's funny to watch Jake, like, all of a sudden become one of the bouncers. Get out of here. Throw yeah. people out with the bouncers. It's an interesting moment. Is he covering up that he's been caught in his obsession, that it's led him all the way out the door? And so he's trying to kind of simulate that while he sneaks his way back into the club. Or, you know, is he just kind of a guy who gravitates to violence? So this was something he just felt like doing in that moment. It's, it's interesting why he doesn't just go, go back into the club. He just helps the bouncer throw people out. Uh, and I love that there's a little interaction between the bouncer and those guys who are left a little bit too. There's a conversations about it. Yeah. My feeling about Jake helping the bouncers I mean, I don't think he's comfortable in the club. I don't think he knows what to do. I don't think he's a social person. I don't think he, I think he's comfortable as a bouncer. Yeah. I think that right. job makes perfect sense to him. You know? Get out of here. Yeah, yeah. We're back at the pool. Joy goes over to the fence and calls Vicky, who comes over, and we're talking through the fence. This little bit of dialogue, it's so simple, but it's so perfect. How you doing? All right, what are you doing? Yeah, not too much. What are you doing? Oh, are you calling? No, it's my brother's. Did you ever meet my brother? No, is that him? Yeah. You want to meet him? All right. Her delivery, I don't think anyone could do this like Kathy Moriarty. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know? I agree. It's, it just feels so totally real in that world. And there's something a little bit unknowable about Vicky, you know? Yeah. And the camera pans to Jake getting out of the car. He's wearing like a super cool jacket. I mean, he looks cool. And and the fact is, is that he is a very successful person compared to probably most of the people that Vicky, who at the time is 15 or 16, interacts with. He's not a gangster. Exactly. Yeah. There are two points in this movie where I had a thought and then the thought was confirmed, <laughs> which is I'm watching them talk to each other. And the first thing I think about was Marlon Brando and Eva Marie Saint and On the Waterfront. Yeah. And that, in fact, is exactly what Scorsese and De Niro were thinking about. When they went, when they were kind of setting up this relationship, yeah. um, introduces him. I love the little pinky shake through the mm-hmm. fence. Nice car. You like that car? It's nice. You want to go for a ride? And there's a long look, and she thinks, and she goes, "All right, gotta give me a few minutes. I have to change, okay?" What do you think, and I don't know that there's an answer to this question, leads to her to make the decision to get in the car and go with this guy? It's funny you asked that. I was thinking that as I was watching the movie in that moment. And all I thought about is, well, when you're young, man, you know, you're, you're, you have to trust your instincts and you, you are intrigued by a little bit of danger and the sense of adventure. Um, which is, of course, every parent's nightmare because they always forget what they were like when they were 15, 16, 17, and 18 and making these decisions and, you know, to putting their lives in the hands of other people or, you know, going with that one person that might lead you to the wrong place. You know, those things are part of growing up. So for me, I think she senses like a like she might have felt the attraction there, too, in that moment. So she's like, OK, I'll go. 
And she's innocent, right? You said she's 15, 16, supposedly. So she isn't aware of how dangerous the world can be, especially in the 19, what, uh, 40s when this is happening. So I think she just kind of takes a chance and she finds him attractive and wants to see where it goes. Because all these other guys have taken her places and driven her around who are mafia dudes and whatever. And they haven't tried, from what we understand, they haven't tried to assault her or anything like that. So in her mind, it's more of the dangerous nature of a guy who's a celebrity in the neighborhood who has a big, who has a nice car. Let's see where this goes. So as you've been talking, my brain has reversed itself five times. (laughs) Let me explain. (laughs) So the first thought I had was I was thinking about, and I'm not asking the question, but I was like, maybe I wonder if I should ask whether or not we think that Vicky is a virgin Mm. at this point. And because my first thought was like, well, if I don't, maybe she's not, and maybe she has slept with Sal. I don't know. Like, because there's something about Kathy Moriarty's performance that is very knowing, you know, Uh seems Mm -hmm. very secure in a way. And so I went, she could be looking at this, my first instinct and going, I understand exactly what this is. I know this is an older man. I know what this older man might be interested in. I'm attracted to him and I'm attracted, attracted the danger of the situation. And all that's very possible. What Paul Schrader said about Kathy Moriarty or what I should say, what Paul Schrader said about Vicky is that she is innocent, but doesn't look innocent. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a very interesting statement and that led me to completely reverse my thought and go, no, she could, she could be a virgin, be totally innocent and naive about these situations and still be behaving in exactly the same way. And we wouldn't be able to know the difference. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Cause she's 15 or 16, exactly. you know, you know, so we're driving. He keeps looking at her as he drives and then says, move over. And she snuggles up to him. I I think her, it's so weird, the difference between her quietness that feels like confidence. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we're at a miniature golf place. She says, I've never played. And he's going to show her how. And he gets behind her. And the framing of the shot is fantastic with this, you know, fake church in the foreground. And he helps her hit the ball. And they hit the ball. And the ball doesn't come out. <laughs> I love the framing of her kneeling at the church, which I think is really interesting. And the use of just that little bit of slow-mo as as it's behind her and she looks back at him. And to me, this feels like early in the relationship. Do you know what I mean? Like when you're dating and you're like, what is this? Are they attracted to me? Like what's going to happen? Where's this going to go? And everything is kind of electrified in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love it. It's a, it's a, it's a, as you say, it's an electric chemistry. It's a flirting. Yeah. It's a, you know, I've, I've felt this a few times in the, sure. in my days. Uh, and, um, it's awesome. It's an awesome yeah. feeling. And sometimes it only lasts for a day. Sometimes it lasts for longer. It all just depends on the situation. Sometimes it only lasts for a night. You just never yeah. know. And so, um, I love this whole way. And look, she's an all white, which makes her virginal. So there's that implication. The way the white, the way she's lit, it makes her a little bit brighter. So almost angelic. Um, and here you have this kind of devilish guy who is, you know, trying to seduce her in a way and he's obsessed with her. So you don't sense necessarily ill feelings here, but it's certainly him. He's in control of the situation in that way with her and she's letting him be in control. Right. And so it's like the whole, like her looking over her shoulder and saying, no, the slow motion, no, when he can't find, when they can't find the ball, there's a lot that goes into that. And I think there's symbolism here too. It's a church, you know, cause it's when they get married, that thing that they lose the plot. So them losing the ball, there's, there's just little things like that for mm. me in my symbolic stupid head. I take and go, okay, this could be something that they were thinking about. Cause why shoot a scene like this uh, where the ball gets lost? Why is that such a big deal? And I always think it has some kind of symbolism to it, but you can see she's lower, he's higher. There's just all these kinds of things that you're watching this that I think is really cool. And then what he says to her at the end when he says, she says, what does this mean? He goes, the game is over. So in a way, he's saying the game, in my opinion, I'm, I'm analyzing this and feeling like he's saying the game is over. Yes, surface wise, the game is over. But he's also saying to her, the game is over. Like, you're going to be with me. It, yeah, it's, it's, that's what I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, and, and I think I'll tell you something weird. Mm. I should feel dread in this scene. I've already seen that he's abusive and dangerous, but for some sure. reason, I, it's not what I feel. 
Right. Like em- emotionally, I'm sort of, it's f- fun. Uh, I don't know if it's fun, but I, I'm into it. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I think because of how they lay out this guy, like you said, this guy's our, int- our protagonist, yet he's, uh, you know, has, uh, he's prone to violence as we've seen. We haven't seen him beat anybody other than in the ring, but certainly the implication in how his wife reacts to him. So we know that he's done that, right? And he's got that element to him, but he's also a guy who has a little bit of nobility in that he doesn't want to go with the mob. He's right. also a guy who has an affection for his brother. Uh, he's also a guy who legitimately has a, a desire to become successful in what he's to, And then we saw when he walked into the nightclub that people were catering to him. People liked him. So they've, if they've Scorsese has subconsciously make a, made us like the guy a little bit. And even some of the exchanges, the familiar exchanges with him and his brother kind of humanize him so that when we get to this moment, we're not seeing a future um physically assaulting man of a woman of a woman here in this moment what we're seeing is a guy who's got some shit going on and some real problems but who is being very soft and tender and vulnerable with this woman and so we can't help but feel a little sympathy for him in this moment uh instead of dread but yes you're right logically we should be feeling dread but the way they've laid it out we kind of have more sympathy for him in this moment you, you know what i think it is too is i think that the intense, unwavering, focused, obsessive, dangerous quality that he yeah. has when things are negative, he has that same quality in his attraction. So that mm. the the way that he looks at her when when all of his, you know, affectionate, erotic, obsessive attraction is directed at her. Yeah, yeah. How has that got to feel? I don't think anyone has ever looked at her, even though she's a beautiful woman that people have right. checked out before. No one has ever focused it on her the way that Jake LaMotta does, yeah. you know? And some women like that, you know, when they become the focus of a man that they haven't attracted. Of course. Uh, we end up at the kitchen. We realize that this is his dad's place that he has bought for him. There were a whole bunch of scenes with Jake LaMotta's father. And I think they said there were clearance problems. Like they couldn't get the rights to use, like that person did not want their life to be in the movie or something like that. So they cut them out. <laughs> um, and he, they sit down at the table and he gets her a drink. And then there's, just, it's amazing that with no dialogue, you can feel such connection between oh, yeah. these two people. Mm-hmm. It's really palpable. And he goes, she's sitting across the table from him. He goes, why don't you sit over here? It's a little closer. So far away, like on the other side of the room. And very slowly, she gets up. She sits next to him. He takes her hand. And then he says, come here. And now she gets up and she yeah. moves over and sits on his lap. And she said almost nothing. We barely heard her voice. You yeah. Know? Oh, true. Very true. I like when they, buy the, they move through the dining room and there's a cage for a bird. And he's like... It's a bird. It was a bird. It's dead now, I think. And they go down the hallway. Again, everything is compressed in terms of space. Everything is narrow, Mm. close spaces. We go into the bedroom. They sit down on the bed. And and just the the tentative nature with which he puts his arm around her waist. Yeah. And then, and it's, you could see all the negotiations of like, is it okay if I put my arm around your waist? As she doesn't say it's not okay, she just stands up. Right, right. And moves away from him and looks over at this picture. And it is a picture of Jake and Joey in boxing poses. Yeah. There's a little crucifix a rosary hanging from them. So like the the mix of religious imagery is always going to be part of this film. Yeah. Um, and they are framing the photo. So they're on either side of the photo. And this is like the cold conflict of the movie. Yes. yes. The two brothers fighting, the, the, the husband and wife them in the middle of it and how that's going to tear everything apart. Right. And we're really close now and we can see her reflection just a little bit. Yeah, beautifully well. Yeah, Which I'm sure is true. Yeah. And he leans in and he kisses her. And I think it's very gentle the way that he first kisses her. Of course. Yeah. Well, he's got that again, like the guys who get into these, um, violent relationships or uh, physically abusive relationships. A lot of women who are in these relationships tell you like at the beginning, he was so nice and attentive and 
all about me. He's very respectful and blah, blah, blah. And it's not until they get you that their uglier sides come out. And so you're seeing what he's doing here. And again, this humanizes him. We've all had this kind of nervous, desirous moment with someone we have an attraction for. And so all of that is feeling universal as we're watching him go through these motions. And she is like, and I'm sure there are women who, um, who've watched the movie or who may be listening to us have been in that position where they kind of like that they're, or they kind of, not like, how can I say this? They're kind of, um, making a little mini game out of this because they're not hundred percent ready to give themselves over, but they kind of feel like they want to, they just want to feel comfortable about doing it. So her moving off the bed, her refusing the liquor, uh, her moving to the, the, um, armoire for lack of a better term, um, is all a way of like, okay, I need to kind of come to a place where I'm okay with things. And so her giving him the smile there, which she, he starts to talk about is her way of essentially saying, okay, I'm, I'm into this with you. I, I'm going to stand by my statement that there are elements of Vicky that are unknowable, hmm. but I'm also going to say in the, I'm going to lean towards the, she's far more innocent than I initially thought that she was. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's where I'm leaning at this moment. Cause, cause we don't get to know, you know, she's yeah. in all of the little tentative agreements or acknowledgements that happen as she makes the decision that what he's doing is okay. Yeah. And she knows that the decision she's making is going to lead to something more. Right. And she looks at him and she smiles and he touches her cheek gently. And then he very gently moves her out of frame. And yeah. what I love is we're just sitting there looking at the shot, the photo of Joey and Jake. And then there's also next to it is a little round mirror. Yeah, you just see a hint of their reflection vaguely in that little round mirror as they yeah. move away. Yeah, I, 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 mirrors play a hugely important part in this film. Reflections play an important part. The religious imagery plays an important part. Yeah. And I think you know how I said I don't feel dread, like when we we're at the miniature golf thing. Oh yeah, yeah. At this moment, this is where I actually start to feel a little bit of dread. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I don't know if this is going in a good direction. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think as Vicky and Jake have finally come together, being both the most important love story in the movie and the most important conflict of the movie, this is a good time to end part one of our exploration of Raging Bull. Of course, we would love to hear your thoughts. Yes, we are going through this slowly, but this is Raging Bull, for God's yeah. sake. So what do you expect? Um, <laughs> as always, you can visit us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for The Cinephiles. It's Cine underscore files on Twitter. It's The Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. We would love you to subscribe to the show if you haven't already on YouTube, on Spotify. And if you're on Apple Podcasts and you've already subscribed to the regular feed for just $4.99 a month or $49.99 a year, you can subscribe to the paid feed where you will get this episode, along with every other episode we've ever done soon, all mm -hmm. ad free. And we are rolling out all of our well over 200 cinephile shorts. These are great conversations with John and I. So definitely check that out on Apple Podcasts. Or you can also go to patreon.com where those same things are available and a whole bunch of other things on our other tiers, including watch alongs, the ability to join our advisory board to ask questions about the film that we're working on, as you've heard. And you can also buy or stream Raging Bull along with every other film we've ever uh, reviewed on cinephiles.net. And if you want to reach me, it's SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. John, how would folks reach you? You can always find me at the Roca says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca says, um, and my other podcasts, uh, they're the Geek Buddies and the Hot Mic for you all to enjoy. Um, and I think that's it for this week. We will be back next time with part two of our exploration of Raging Bull right here on The Cinephiles. 